Good morning. It's always great to be together and to have a few minutes in God's Word. And we're going to be uh, on the book of Amos and Jeremiah and a couple other places. Uh, if you'd like to join us, I'll be uh, starting in Jeremiah 23. But uh, before I get to the Bible this morning, I just wanted to remind you a couple of things. First of all, we are uh, we're still uh, in stewardship month and thinking about stewardship and stewardship is simple definition using what God has entrusted to us in a way that would please God. It's his. James says every good gift and every perfect gift from above from the Father of lights and so every good thing we have came from God technically still belongs to him I guess you know how you do ownership he gives us to us or whatever but but he gave us time he gave us life he gave us health he gave us marriage money jobs homes a country a church a bible the right to pray the privilege of prayer he gave us all these things stewardship is using what he's given us in a way that pleases the owner the master the steward doesn't own anything the steward simply is taking care of what really belongs to the guy he works for and so one of the things we talk about stewardship is missions. And when we realize how much money Americans spend on dogs and cats and how much money Americans spend on coffee and, and then habits, tobacco and booze and, and, um, and, and just fun things, you know, from a golf game to a bowling game to, uh, uh, you know, ice cream. You know, I'm not talking about sinful things always. Sometimes it's just we're blessed. We are so blessed. And we ought to be so grateful to God for his great, rich blessings. But the world's going to hell. The bottom line is, without Christ, there is no salvation. And uh, this world that we're in desperately needs Jesus Christ. And a good steward takes what he's given us and invests in what pleases the owner. Well, what could please God more than the souls of men hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ? God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. That's how important uh, people are to God. So important, he was willing to give his son. Um, are we willing to give our children? Absolutely. Uh, all my children can serve him and go where he wants them to go. And But, but then... Am I okay with God having my one of my children have cancer or things that we call bad? Well, if I gave them to him, then I gave them to him to use as he sees fit. But a good steward um, trains up children the way they should go. A good steward uses their finances pleasing. Well, anyway, I'm just looking at this missions book, and, and most of you in our church, of course, you have these, but just um, tells about the different missionaries. This is uh, the Southeast Asia section of the book. Um, this is um, a section of, from North America, Central America, and uh, 100 plus families, 140 families, uh, dear people, and over and over, some that I went to school with 50 years, 45 years ago, and some that are, are my children, some that are the children who grew up in our church. And I just look at these people and memories and they're just wonderful Christians and such great people. Um, Let's be faithful to our missions commitments. Let's consider um, our missionaries and, and realize these people who've chosen to give up their country and give up their, in many cases, their health, their family members. Well, we ought to be faithful to give to missions and be a good steward. And uh, anyway, just wanted to, to throw out the thought on that. Um, and then also, uh, could I encourage you, our uh, October 1st, Sunday to Wednesday is our family conference, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Monday night, Tuesday night, Wednesday night. We're just focusing for four days on the home and how important the home is. And I hope you'll come and, uh, and I hope you'll pray that God would bless it and bless that time that we have there and bless these mission. pray that God would bless these missionaries. Um, they're facing battles and they need, they need our prayers. We need to uphold them in prayer. And then I want to encourage you, October 1st, this next Sunday, is the opening day of Foundations Baptist Church in Rialto. Please pray. Take a moment. Shut this off for a moment and pray. Uh, Pastor Tim Peterson, starting this church, grew up here, born and raised in our church. And he and his wife, Sarah, are starting this church. And it'll be, uh, it'll be fun. It's, uh, we've, we've helped, to varying degrees, quite a few churches get started. Some we've been very involved. Others lightly, simply, just a little of 
But uh, but most of those churches are still going. A couple of them aren't, but most of them are. And um, and it, it's just a great thing. And so I hope that you'll pray for the church and uh, give toward it. Uh, what could be more? What could be better stewardship than getting another church going that would be preaching Christ and knocking on doors and and uh, seeing young people surrender their lives to serve God in another city, and that we could have a part in that? I've been up there and knocked on doors, and I've spent time, much time praying, and uh, we're all giving uh, toward it. So anyway, uh, those are three things: our missionaries, our family conference, and then Foundations Baptist October first. And um, anyway, it's great, great to be a part. Of the work of God. Now, I want to take a minute and show you a couple of verses, and I'm going to start in Jeremiah chapter 23, and um, the, the 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 subject here is about our our attitude or our heart, and and I know I don't care what your your heart feels; I care what you do, but. God does no notice your heart too. Your heart does matter, and you'll see that in the scriptures today. Um, m many of us who've been around to say a child who did wrong, and when you see that child with no remorse and no guilt, and they don't care, they're caught and they don't care, and they're punished and they don't care. You know, we've all probably all of us heard uh, a circumstance, either audio or video or whatever, where somebody did some horrible crimes and. And they're in court, and they and the the judge would say, or the attorney would say, they have no remorse. They exhibit no no remorse. They're not even sorry for the horrible, uh, traumatic situation they brought about, or whatever. People do care. Now then you know people who they, they got this uh, false remorse. They're just broken over it, hoping they don't get in trouble. They're not sorry they did wrong. They're sorry they got caught. But and if they could do it again, more careful, uh, you know they might do it. But um, I've heard a great story. Um, I think it was Brother David Gibbs. Uh, he said when they were kids, somebody nearby had a big watermelon patch and they'd sneak in there. And he said, we snuck in there one time. We know we shouldn't. And they got a watermelon, took it over the into the bush somewhere far away. And, and they would core it somehow, like take a can and put it in the end, just pull the inside out. You know, the center of the watermelon is the sweetest, not as many seeds. And they said, we got in there. And, and he's, 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 he said... You know, you know you're in trouble. You know you did wrong and, and the guilty conscience and all. And he said, and you know what we did? We we cored that thing and opened it all up. And you know what we did? We went and got a ripe. We put that one back and got a ripe one. <laughs> there, uh, godly sorrow worketh repentance. And um, they went back and just got one that was ripe. But uh, I want you to look with me at Jeremiah 23 and uh, Jeremiah 23, 32. <clears throat> And if you've never heard David Gibbs tell stories, nobody tells stories like him. And you hear, you try to retell an illustration. He is, this is no way. The guy's, he is a, he's an amazing orator. Jeremiah 23 and verse 32, Behold, I am against them that prophesy false dreams, saith the Lord, and do tell them and cause my people to err by their lies. But notice this, not just their lies and their false dreams, but it says, and their lightness. Yet I sent them not, nor commanded them. Therefore, they shall not profit this at people at all. A lightness. They, they don't care. It's not serious. Uh, they, they take it lightly. And this is not a serious matter. If you go over to the book of Isaiah, chapter 57. Isaiah before Jeremiah. And Isaiah chapter 57 and verse 10. Uh, he says, Thou art wearied in the greatness of... Of thy way. Um, here, these people were in a great place, their great country, and they had a great opportunity, and they had all these incredible privileges. And they're tired of it. I'm tired of going to Sunday school. I'm tired of going to church. I'm tired of, uh, of whatever. So, you know, some man, he said, I'm just tired. I don't feel like going to church today. His wife said, No, you should. He said, You know what? I don't. People don't like me there. They don't treat me right there. Why should I go? She said, Well, you should. And he said, I don't, I don't want to go. No one, no one wants me there. And he said, give me one reason why I should go. And she said, because you're the pastor. And, uh, and, and these are people, he's saying, the lightness. They take it lightly. They don't take it serious. And, and here, they're, they're in a great way. They're in a wonderful, divine opportunity. And they're tired of it. They get bored of it. And I was like getting bored of, with the Bible. Oh, 
uh, this is an eternal book. You're going to, this is something that you're probably in this office. This is the only thing that's going to be in heaven besides me. And um, this, this book, uh, don't take it lightly. And uh, they're wearied in the greatest. They're tired. People do that. I've been teaching this Sunday school class so long. I've been working in the nursery for years. I've been driving a bus for a long time. I've been a bus captain for whatever. And they get wearied in the greatness of their way. The very thing that's laying up treasures for them in heaven, they get tired of it. Oh, we ought to be so careful to not get weary in the greatness of our way. Over in the book of Amos, uh, Amos chapter 6 and uh, Amos chapter 6, Hosea, Joel, and Amos, they've fallen right after the book of Daniel. Hosea 6, 6, uh, he says um, that drink wine in bowls and anoint themselves with chief ointments that are not grieved for the affliction of Joseph. He says a problem you've got is you're not grieved over, you're, you're, you're being punished and you still don't care. You're being, you're, you're, you're being chastened for your sinfulness and, and you don't care. And oh, this is a this is a huge thing. And God says you're not going to profit. Uh, you know, when a child does something wrong and there's no grief as they're being punished, boy, that's a terrible day. And uh, you uh, you ought to start praying. I we did when our children were before they were born. We began praying that God would give them a tender heart, that our children would be soft and obedient, and that they would want to do right. And when they did wrong, that they would get caught. Oh, my wife especially, she prayed. Oh God, help them get caught. Help them not get away with, help them to know they're not, because we're not going to get away with anything. But we ought to pray that uh, that our children would be would be soft-hearted. Jeremiah 3, 3 says, you refuse to be ashamed. You refuse to be ashamed. And um, it's just a, a very sad thing that people, they look lightly on their sin. And America today is, they, they, they're trying to make everything okay. Nothing's a sin. Drugs and alcohol and immorality and and breaking the law from the white house and crossing the border illegally nothing's illegal nothing's there's they they just make light of everything and cussing and vulgarity and suggestive comments and and and, and indiscreet innuendos and and it's like nothing they make light of all of it that is a sin the 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 the, the ambiance the spirit of people that caused Israel to be judged because they made light of things that should have been very, very serious and very heavy. Um, uh, and I'm not, uh, I'm not making any excuse for sin here. Um, we do understand we're all sinners. Uh, Isaiah 64 says we're all as an unclean thing. All our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. Over in Romans, it says there's none that doeth good, no, not one. And we understand that we're all sinners. We understand that that um, that we're going to fail, but see the difference is is the broken heart. That's the difference. And over in um, uh, over in Second Corinthians, I won't turn there. I've gone long enough here already. But Second Corinthians seven ten, it says, "Godly sorrow worketh repentance." And so we're gonna mess up. First John it says the First John chapter two. He says, uh, "Write these things, you that you sin not. Do right. Don't sin." But if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And, and he says, oh, live clean, live holy. But when you sin, remember, Jesus is there and he'll forgive you. Turn to him, confess it. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. Chapter 1 says, uh, 1 John, but if we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us. Not confess to a man, don't confess to any priest, don't confess to me, confess to God. He's the one that you sinned against. But um, so I, we understand that there is a, there, that we're going to sin. The issue that God says is you sin and you don't care. You sin and you excuse it. You sin and you, you do something so clearly against scripture and you know in your heart that you shouldn't do it. You allowed someone to talk you into it. You allowed someone to help you justify your sin. And now you keep talking yourself into excusing that horrible thing you did um, big or little, you know, I always call big things and bad little things, but if it violates God's law, it violates God's law. And some, somebody at work or some big shot or some important person convinced you it would be okay if you did this. You know what? It's not. If it violates God's word, it's wrong. And don't make it light and don't make it a little thing. Well, I'm doing this to get even or I'm paying back. And no, you don't do it to get even. You don't pay back. That's not what we do. That's not what God's people do. 
And um, we ought to be so careful. But, but let's, let's just not make light of our sin. Um, God, God is not nearly as concerned about us doing wrong as he is us doing wrong and justifying it or doing wrong and not caring, not having a repentant heart, not having a broken heart. When we sin, it ought to, it ought to crush us. I'm thinking right now of a situation. If you want to look over to Isaiah 66, uh, I'm sitting now, just popped into my head a situation I was in as an unsaved teenager. And I, I was in a situation, maybe a sophomore in high school, and it wasn't a horrible situation. Most people wouldn't even think it was wrong. But as an unsaved teenager, I, I found myself in a position, and, um, and, I can, and I remember walking home, and one afternoon, evening, whatever it was, I remember walking home, and I hated myself. I just, I just, I hated myself. And um, how could I allow myself to be in a position like this? And again, most probably most of the world, if I said what I had been around, most people wouldn't think it was wrong. But but it sure bothered me as a 16-year-old unsaved teenager. I wasn't even a Christian. I knew some. I knew some right and wrong. And I had good good parents, and and we had a good home, and and um, and I'm I'm crossing, and I thought I, I am not gonna live like this, and and the conviction on my heart, and I wish I'd have gotten saved. I think if someone would have given me the gospel right then, I'd have got saved right then. But it's two years later, before someone explained to me how to be saved. But there ought to be a grief in our heart. The big problem we've got in Washington is nobody cares about how sinful they are, and the problem we've got in our pulpits is. Preachers that don't care about naming sins as long as they got a big congregation. Uh, Christian schools are one of the biggest jokes in America because no one's willing to enforce any rules and no one's willing to say this is wrong and this is right and, and there's no grief in our hearts. Well, if you look at Isaiah chapter 66, and here's what God says. In Isaiah 66 verse 2, he says, For all these things, all those things, hath mine hand made. All the heavens and the earth, God made all these things. But listen what he says, and all those things have been, saith the Lord, but to this man will I look. This is the man that God is going to pay attention to. Is it a perfect man? Is it a man who gives lots of money or a man who's who's some great preacher or something? No. He says, to this man will I look. He that is poor and of a contrite spirit and trembleth at my word. God says, I'll tell you the guy that, I, that gets my attention. And not, it's not poor economically. But a man who's poor, he's humble, and he realizes how wrong he is. He's poor and of a contrite contrition. He's broken over his sin. When he does wrong, he, he grieves. He hates that he does wrong. And when he reads the word of God, he trembles. God says, that's the man I'm paying attention. That's the one that's going to get my eye. And I, I, I would love to say that every time I did wrong from that 16th, year old unsaved teenager to this day that every time I did wrong I had that same brokenness and and I'm and I'm the first one to admit it I there are times I didn't have that brokenness but look then you look back and and you realize you know what a what a, a, a terrible situation or your words were so wrong and you you know you in in defense and your maybe it was your uh, trying to defend yourself or trying to retaliate you you said things hurtful things and Oh, the, the grief and the sorrow in our heart. And God says, I'm looking for the guy that trembles at my word. Quick illustration at the end here. Jeremiah tells the, <clears throat> excuse me, tells a story. Jeremiah had written the scriptures from God and gave it to Baruch. Jeremiah was in hiding because they were trying to kill him. And he, and he goes and he's reading the scripture, his sidekick, reading the scripture on the streets, uh, street corners. And one of the king's soldiers grabbed him and took him to the king and and um, showed him this thing and said he's been reading this stuff and and it made the king so mad um, he, he he took out a knife and and he cut it up and and threw it in the fire well he knew right and wrong and he didn't care he just flat did not care he didn't care that his nation was being condemned and and there ought to be a trembling um, at uh, at his word well the other side of that is is uh, Josiah Eight years old, he takes the throne at the death of his father. At 16 years old, he begins to seek the Lord. At 20 years old, he's cleaning the nation up. And he's and he's doing this without a Bible yet. And he goes to the priest and says, you need to open the doors of the temple. You need to clean that place up and get it straightened up where there can be worship again. 
and we can we can obey God. And as they're cleaning the temple up, they find the scriptures, and um, and they bring and so all this that, jo that Josiah had done was without a Bible. He knew we know most things are right and wrong, and um, so they bring it to him, and they read the scriptures, and and Josiah rends his clothes or tears his clothes, and he falls down in grief before God. And long story short, when God be, ends up commenting on the situation, he said, I was going to wipe your whole country out, but you were so broken, I'll spare the nation during your lifetime. And, um, and I've often wondered what would have happened if his boys would have had a tender heart like he did. Would God have spared the nation another generation? And if their kids another generation? Oh, there ought to be a brokenness. You know, that wicked king in Jeremiah's day cut the Bible up and threw it in the fire. He didn't care. It didn't matter because God, God just had Jeremiah write it again and he added more to it. But, um, but oh, Josiah, he trembled at the word of God. Um, this book, it's a wonderful book. We ought to tremble before it. And we ought to be grieved over our sin. Um, we're going to sin. I hate it and I wish we didn't. But all of sin didn't come short of the glory of God. But I'll tell you what, we can sure cry over it. And we can desire to be holy and clean and right. And uh, let's have a let's don't let's don't consider things light. Um, that's sin is not a light thing. That child, somebody in their church saying their child did something that was wrong. He's disobedient, little one, you know, like two year old, three year old, and uh, they did something that was wrong, but it was so funny. And they said, I, I wanted to laugh. It was hilarious, but it was defiance. And so he told the child, you just sit there and don't you move. And they had to go into the room and get, get composed because they didn't want to make light of this child's rebellion. It was just so funny the way the child did it. And, and if you've had little ones, you know those kids are funny. Little ones are, the children are a blessing, but they can be bad too. But all that our children, pray for your children, pray for your grandchildren. They would have a tender heart toward God. And they'd repent of their sin, that they would go to God with a broken heart and oh, how we need it. And if you feel, maybe you're far, feel far from God because you've done some wrong. Oh, seek him, seek him. He's near, he forgives and he welcomes. Uh, he wants you back, um, but he doesn't want you back arrogantly justifying your sin. He wants you back broken. He wants you back with a longing to be clean and to be right. And uh, if I can be a help, call me. I'd love to be helping any way that I can. Hope you have a great day. Thanks for joining us this morning.